Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, you see my slides okay. All right. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, today. And, and uh, what we're going to move on to next is how we might consider some very farm specific or basic biosecurity practices that could potentially be put in place uh, now and in the future to prevent spread of high path avian flu as well as other things. So before I start, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to just give a little shout out to uh, Dr. Beckett Whittle at the uh, Center for Food Security and Public Health at Iowa State University. Uh, if you've had any experience with that, uh, her and her team there, they're largely responsible for uh, setting up, developing, implementing, and, and training uh, folks on our food, uh, secure food supply plans. So uh, in this case, secure milk supply would be an example, secure beef, secure pork, uh, secure sheep and wool, uh, and others. So a lot of the concepts that we're going to talk about this afternoon when it comes to biosecurity against high path avian flu, as Dr. Habing said earlier, applied to other diseases, um, in, including what the secure milk supply plan develops. So I do want to make the distinction here now that uh, what I'm going to go through and, and some of what Dr. Root is going to go through uh, while the basics are rooted in the secure milk supply plan, this is not uh, the, the, the secure milk supply plan. The concepts are the same, uh, but the secure milk supply plans are uh, developed and set up to pr protect against uh, foot and mouth disease virus infection, and which is a very, very contagious, uh, very highly spreadable disease and and we think high path at flu is too, but probably on different level. And so to act, uh, actually set up a secure milk supply plan for your operation involves enhanced levels of biosecurity. So uh, much of the concepts we're gonna talk about today are the same, but we're gonna focus on sort of the, uh, the simple things that we might be able to put in place. Uh, and it might not, it could develop on your farm and your operation into the level of enhanced biosecurity, but these are some basics, uh, if you will. I also want to give a shout out to American Association of Bovine Practic Practitioners and the National Milk Producers Federation. They've done a great job of providing resources for biosecurity on dairy farms, and, and some of what I'm going to uh, discuss today uh, comes from some of that good work that they've done. Uh, so, one of the things I love about working with dairy producers is their creativity and ingenuity. So if you got a flat tire on the skiddy, uh, you don't go get a jack. You just get the other skiddy and, and lift that up. And and so uh, th that's a credit to our dairy our dairy producers and, and dairy workers and dairy veterinarians is that we're creative, resourceful people. Uh, and we'll get through this um, and, and we'll get through this together. <laughs> Uh, helping each other uh, and lift, lifting each other up there. So, uh, and that brings me uh, to the next slide. And and so, whenever we're having a, a potential spread uh, of a contagious organism throughout our operations, uh, we want to keep in mind that uh, that you as producers are, are are the first line defense against trying to keep your herd free from preventing that exposure from containing it within your farm if, if you do have exposure and then trying to limit the spread. Uh, as Alex said, it, it, when things leave the farm, uh, hopefully hopefully none of you have to, to deal with that in this situation, but uh, in case you do, that, that we, we rely heavily on you as producers for that. Our regulatory officials um, who are quite busy right now dealing with all this and have really hard jobs are, are uh, responsible for trying to help us uh, as an industry prevent this uh, spread and, and figure out when can we move things, when can we not move things. Um, and as Do Dr. Having mentioned earlier, yes, we have a, uh, a, a USDA order coming next week that's going to restrict some spread. I'm sure Dr. Summers will address that, or, or sorry, re uh, restrict movement of cattle, at least lactating cattle. Um, that's what we think, at least at this point, and more information will be coming soon, and he'll probably address that 
uh, a little bit at the end too. So farm biosecurity on the farm biosecurity in, includes a lot of different things. And this is related to the pillars that, that Alex just mentioned, but we want to really watch and control and restrict access to what vehicles enter uh, our farms. Okay. And, re and record those in some way. Uh, we might, we're going to talk a little bit about washing or at least disinfecting, spraying wheels, things like that uh, for uh, vehicles and other equipment that that have to come onto the farm or that have to leave the farm. Uh, we need to consider uh, PPE, protective wear for visitors, uh, necessary visitors uh, when they're on the farm and, and provide some protective wear, uh, as Dr. Habing mentioned earlier, for those employees working on the farm. Uh, all of the farm employees are responsible for helping and assisting with a biosecurity plan uh, that you implement on, on your farm. And it, it requires uh, a little bit of training, it requires uh, setting up some standard operating procedures. Uh, and then finally, which is really, really difficult, we'll talk about a little bit our, our wildlife and pest control measurements. So three basic areas for you to consider on your operation. Think about what comes in and what has to go out. And then think about what do I actually need uh, to, to run my operation? And so we might think about non-essential visitors, uh, just uh, doing away with that for a, a brief period of time. Um, what cattle have to come in, what cattle have to leave. Uh, and again, how can we work with wildlife and pest management? I'm going to go into more detail on each of these. Uh, <clears throat> there was a question that uh, went through the Q&A a little bit about unpasteurized milk to calves. We're going to talk about that more. So we did see that and we'll address that. Um, isolate new or returning animals. If you have heifers raised at another facility, if you can manage it to isolate or set up a quarantine area when those animals come back, we'll go into more detail on that. Obviously, sick animals that fit the criteria for this particular disease, uh, we can find a spot for them. It might start in the hospital uh, it might grow from there, depending on what happens. Uh, sanitizing milk uh, and other uh, health care, feeding, stomach tubes, uh, buckets, things like that. And then, as I mentioned before, we need to provide PPE for our workers. Uh, try to restrict contact for your workers with other farms. Uh, hopefully they don't have to leave and, and go to another farm. Certainly poultry farms we want to consider uh, with this as well and, and avoid drinking uh, raw milk. At this point, uh, we have confidence in our, our our food safety program. We have confidence in pasteurization. Uh, but uh, for those consider consuming raw milk, uh, we might want to reconsider during this time period. So what what needs to come on and off? Right? Obviously, your your nutritionist might need to come on and off. Your veterinarian. Do you have an AI technician? Um, especially if you have an outside AI technician, they've probably been on other operations. They're probably going to be on other operations when they leave yours. So uh, clean coveralls, clean boots, we'll talk more about that too, but I, I would provide on-farm dedicated footwear uh, for those. The call truck needs to come on. We need to consider that. Uh, feed deliveries, right? there's some things that we can't uh, avoid. There's, there's, th uh, options that we have. Potentially, we have a, an on-farm truck and trailer that we can load our call cattle to and drive it out to the end of the driveway or to an unloading area at some point. Uh, I think Dr. Root is going to talk a, a little bit about uh, developing a line of separation uh, around your operation. Can we deliver things to the line of separation and auger feed across so that we can move feed around with on-farm vehicles to deliver to bins uh, so that those vehicles don't have to come in the driveway and come up to the barn and drive around uh, our operation. Those are all things to, to think about. So can we set our trash removal out closer to the road or to the side road or somewhere so those don't have to come on? Can we have our, our uh, uh, <clears throat> other deliveries, uh, product deliveries. Can we have to those delivered to the house uh, up the road or down the street? Uh, can we have our Amazon deliveries or whatever uh, sent somewhere else? So uh, those are all, all things to think about and consider how just to reduce the amount of traffic, outside traffic that comes on the farm, especially if that traffic has been on other 
dairy operations or poultry operations or is going uh, to dairy operations. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, the federal order is going to affect <laughs> this slide, uh, which I made before that came out yesterday. But uh, at least as far as lactating cattle, it looks like we're going to have to jump through some new hoops uh, to move those. Again, I'll let Dr. Summers talk about that, whether that involves all lactating cattle or or just healthy cattle moving uh, interstate. But uh, we, we want <clears throat> to try, try our best to restrict uh, moving from sites with known um, high path uh, infected cattle. Um, and again, if we can do it, I realize how hard this is, but if we can do it and we have to bring animals back from another facility and we're worried uh, about uh, lateral transmission with those animals that are coming back from another state or another facility. If we can uh, identify a place to put them uh, where they can be isolated and we can watch for 21 days, uh, that's that's ideal. So your operation may or may not um, allow for that. Uh, obviously, this federal order is probably going to change the way we're uh, testing for this, and typically that testing involves nasal swabs for non-lactating cattle uh, and milk samples for, for lactating cattle. So over the last several weeks, there's been several states around the country that have uh, enforced additional restrictions for interstate movement of dairy cattle uh, as a result of this, and, and Ohio is affected by that since we have an, an infected farm uh, and so every dairy in the state essentially uh, has to abide by those rules because the, the state as a whole is is lumped into some of those restrictions. And and so there's already some testing to certain states uh, required. This new federal order will require all interstate movement. Probably we think of lactating cattle. So stay tuned for that. Uh, keep checking in with your with your veterinarian, your state. Uh, animal health officials uh, for more information on that. It's an evolving uh, situation. Uh, if we can, we want to milk our returning cattle. If we're bringing heifers back from a heifer raiser, spring, uh, uh, fresh heifers, uh, if we can, we want to milk them last. If we can put them in a separate pan, a separate area of the barn, um, milk them last and then run our, our system cleaning uh, after that. Uh, if we can and we can manage it, we want to have separate or dedicated personnel to care for those uh, or those cattle are, are cared for first. And maybe some PPE has changed before we go to the, the resident herd um, so we can have a, a dedicated boots, dedicated outerwear, uh, potentially dedicated animal care equipment uh, just for those returning cattle. Uh, obviously, if we have signs of disease. Dr. Habing went through those. Uh, we want to move those to a hospital pen or isolated area. Uh, if we can figure out a way to do it, we want to avoid fence line contact, fence line feeders, sharing water spaces, right? We, we're pretty sure that, that these cattle are able to spread this through oral nasal secretions. And so there's probably a lot of transmission happening on farms that are infected at the water tanks. Uh, the jury's still out, I think, a little bit on, you know, whether this is spread in the parlor at, at milking time. Uh, we know that we can find a high viral load in the milk. Uh, how much of that lateral transmission is happening, I think, is, is yet to be determined. So for those who have to care for sick cows, it's great if you can have a crew or a person or two that's dedicated uh, to working with sick uh, cows only and not necessarily non-clinical animals. Um, and then if we can, we want to have them change their uh, PPE, uh, clean, wash hands really well, if not showering, uh, have separate equipment. I already mentioned that for working with or treating positive animals if you were to develop this. And again, dedicated outerwear and footwear for that. Wildlife and pest management, as Dr. Habing mentioned, we know that wild uh, waterfowl uh, contribute to the spread of high path avian flu. It's difficult, right? I get it. I understand there's no system that that is perfect, uh, but anything we can do to eliminate wildlife and waterfowl and that contact that it has directly with our cattle just helps us reduce the overall load that these cattle see uh, and uh, maybe could be the difference between 
to spreading it or not. So we do want to watch for, uh, you know, suspicious deaths, more bird deaths on your farm than normal, uh, cats uh, being ill or or dead cats even, and, and make sure you report those, at least to your veterinarian, so they can, can run that up the chain of, of command. Uh, USDA Wildlife Services offers some assistance. Uh, so there's some resources there listed for you uh, on some things that you can do in terms of uh, bird and wildlife control. I know a lot of you uh, deal with that already in the wintertime with the starlings and anything else. So nettings and, and, and screens on curtain-sided buildings, scare devices. I know the birds all get used to them eventually. Um, you have to change the call or change the location or all that, but uh, decoy predators, anything that we can do where there's high traffic areas. Uh, if you have surface water, uh, that a pond, a, a, a lowland, something like that, if we can fence that off or limit, restrict uh, access to that for drinking water source for our cattle, that would be advisable. Uh, fence that off or, or reduce that, um, you know, if we have to use that for drinking water. Do we have any other options for that? Can we chlorinate it? Um, but we want to really try to watch uh, our surface water. On the farm, uh, we want to watch our equipment driving uh, between areas where there could be a lot of bird feces, especially if there's a lot of geese or wild uh, waterfowl there and try not to drive equipment through that area. Can we go around? Can we uh, uh, set up some fencing to reduce the, the flow or gates. Uh, we can use uh, disinfectants to uh, clean and disinfect uh, trucks, tires, uh, equipment, things like that. Depending on the time of year, that could be difficult. Uh, and how much uh, organic debris is already on the equipment will determine on how well we can do that. But um, we want to watch that. Now, if you have a dairy farm and you have poultry, you know, the, the recommendation is let's not try to share equipment across one side of the farm and the other. Uh, let's limit our vehicle transmission uh, back and forth that could spread the virus that's in feces uh, from one area to the barn. The other, can we set up a dedicated entrance for that uh, other, other part of our operation? Hopefully we have dedicated workers just in one area uh, with, with, with poultry and then uh, dairy, uh, for the dairies, we want to clean our animal waters uh, as often as possible, We're recommending daily uh, in this situation. Uh, On-farm dedicated footwear and outerwear for animal caretakers, so they don't bring anything to work with them. They come to work, uh, hopefully cleaned, showered, uh, washed with clean clothes, but then we provide on-farm coveralls, on-farm on footwear that only stays on the farm uh, and, and they only use when they're there. Uh, so that we don't contaminate the inside of their vehicle with anything. And if they happen to be on other farming operations, hopefully they're not bringing that in to contaminate. Uh, for uh, milk callers, nutritionists, uh, AI technicians, providing disposable footwear and outerwear uh, for those necessary visitors, the ones we can't restrict, uh, that they can use when they get, if they have to get out of their vehicle, uh, provide them with on-farm uh, plastic booties, uh, on-farm outerwear uh, that can be uh, discarded uh, once they start to enter their vehicle. Here you see the milk truck driver. Uh, you know, putting this stuff on before their feet hit the ground and then taking that off before they get in their truck to, to leave. And then we can discard that uh, on the farm. Somebody asked about uh, pasteurization for milk, both for human consumption as well as for calves. So, so far, we're not seeing a tremendous amount of reports or hearing a tremendous amount of reports of this clinical disease being spread to our young stock. Uh, that sounds like there are some tests, initial tests that might uh, be showing that we can find a positive here and there's still a lot to learn, still a lot pending, uh, but we want to be careful with feeding uh, raw milk and raw colostrum because we know there's such a, a heavy viral load. So uh, pasteurize or heat treated colostrum and milk uh, or go to milk replacers or bag colostrum uh, and then sanitize milking equipment thoroughly uh, after milking, especially if we have suspect animals or animals that have returned from another facility. Um, and we always want to follow good uh, NMC milking guidelines. So as far as cleaning and disinfecting, uh, 
we can use some wheel spray, some some tire spray on vehicles coming in, leaving the farm, set up a C&D station, something at the end of the driveway or whatever, or near a near a, a, a another building, near your shop, something like that, that you could. There are a lot of different uh, EPA approved disinfectants against uh, high path avian uh, influenza. And then there's a, a a link there that you could go to find those. There's a lot of them. I, I listed a few here, Vercon, uh, even Bleach, um, Excel are some common ones that you probably have heard of. These are good disinfectants that will kill uh, this virus. I don't know if Dr. Root is going to talk much more about C and D, but I'll just mention that to do full and C and D station, it takes all, all these different things, right? We have to have a place that, that drains well, where the wash water is not going to come down. Uh, certainly in cases of the secure milk supply or, or a foot and mouth disease outbreak, we would have to C and D complete, do complete cleaning and disinfecting on far, on vehicles that enter the farm. At this level, it's great if we can start to do some of this for things that have to come on the farm, but even implementing just a wheel wash with some disinfectant uh, to those wheels or undercarriage parts that are going to contact the ground would be a, a good first initial step. So you can use a garden spray or pump spray or something like that with an approved disinfectant to start to at least protect yourself as much as possible. Again, anything we can keep off the farm right now, especially those vehicles that have to travel from farm to farm helps reduce the uh, environmental contamination. Uh, animal caretakers, we talked about that just a little bit. Right now, we think that the risk uh, for disease for those workers is relatively low, but we do wanna be responsible uh, and provide uh, face shields, uh, masks, uh, protective outerwear, gloves, eye protection, especially for those folks that, uh, that, that work in the parlor. Um, and then it's already been mentioned, but practice good uh, hygiene. So uh, those who work with cattle should avoid eating, drinking around the cattle, chewing gum, especially in those cattle uh, working areas. Uh, take off their outerwear, boots and stuff if you go into a, a, an eating um, area. Wash your hands really well. Don't touch your eyes. Um, we, we know that we've... Um, uh, that we've found positive workers with some signs of illness, but uh, we want to be careful uh, with them contaminating other farms, especially uh, after that. So a lot of resources, Dr. Ruta probably mentioned some of these. So I'll send you to the secure uh, milk supply website. There's a lot of good signage there. There's a lot of good activities. Again, the secure milk supply is enhanced biosecurity. The, the, the measures that I've outlined for you today are, are, are certainly part of that, uh, but, but secure milk supply takes it to a whole other level. But there's a lot of good signage there in both English and Spanish that you can print out um, to start to use on your farms, um, things like this that, that uh, you can and hang up. And there's uh, posters about uh, different visitors and how we want to control those as well as on-farm uh, vehicles. So uh, 